Hello and welcome once again to another absolutely amazing, booty shaking, red hot blazing episode of What Happens in... Don't worry, I'm not going to try to rhyme too much. And and hey, if you're here, I take it you're nodding wistfully right now because you're recalling all those good times you had throwing down in Def Jam Vendetta or Fight for New York with your buds. And right about now, you're probably remembering how it was all flushed down the toilet with the release of one of the most disappointing sequels of all time, Def Jam Icon, EA's misguided follow-up to one of their surprise hits of the mid-2000s. So without further ado, let's all find out... Def Jam and Wrestling sure seemed like a random mashup at the time, didn't it? Hip-hop stars, the Aki Engine, EA? Well, that's because it was literally a random mashup. Aki Corporation were working on WCW Mayhem 2 for the PlayStation Double Balling, until Vince bought WCW, thus ruining everything for everyone. So EA lost the license, Aki's work up to that point was floating around nebulously, and to try to salvage everything, they needed another license to fill that void. EA's Canadian office, located in Vancouver, British Columbia, started brainstorming on what to do next. They needed a blueprint, if you will. An opportunity arose when EA started talking to Def Jam Records to feature various artists contracted to the label to appear in a game, along with a number of made-up characters that felt at home in the world of EA Sports. This all came about due to the fact that then Def Jam president Kevin Lyles was a big gamer and noticed more and more hip hop was being used in various soundtracks. EA's Josh Holmes was a fan of the music genre and wanted to make a title that centered around it. The two eventually crossed paths and history was born. Because of the easy to pick up, hard to master nature of Aki's engine, the novelty of playing as big name rappers and the exploding popularity of EA Sports. Vendetta proved to be a hit, spurring EA even further with its sequel, Fight for New York. It featured an expanded story mode, more customization options, fleshed out fighting system, tons of environmental interaction, and a massive roster, including such names as... <gasps> <laughs> anyway, Fight for New York came out at the tail end of 2004, but several team members, including the main producers and designers from EA Vancouver, all left the following year to start up propaganda games, and thus EA lost a lot of the talent that helped make Def Jam series what it was. Simultaneously, EA Chicago were coming off the success of Fight Night Round 3. You know, one of the reasons that even made you want to buy an HD console? I think you can see where this is all going. Boxing and fighting are the same thing, right? No! People only want good visuals, right? No! Right! Well, get Chicago on this thing. So long, Aki! Hello, Kudo Sonoda! It's time to talk about Kudo. He first cut his teeth on some random games for 3DO, like Army Men Air Attack and War Jets, before finding a job with EA in 2004, just as Fight for New York was wrapping up. The visual fidelity and innovation scene in Round 3 impressed a lot of people, but just because Def Jam and Fight Night shared some similarities, like basically they're centered around a combative sport, didn't mean they would mix well together, and spoilers, they didn't mix well together. Producer Michael Mandheim, in a 2014 interview with Complex.com, dishes out the deets on what went wrong. We had the opportunity to do the next Def Jam game, and this was obviously after the success of Fight Night Round 3. The reviews were definitely mixed, and I think the biggest problem with the title was that we didn't stay true to the previous ones. We let down some of the fans of Def Jam. EA Chicago was a development group that prided itself on innovating. They took a boxing game and infused it with innovation. We tried to do the same with Def Jam Icon. Here was our problem. We tried to innovate too much. It was an existing brand with an existing fan base that was in love with the previous games. If you look at something like Mortal Kombat, they don't really change the mechanics of that game too much. They change the story, add new technology, new moves, characters, but Mortal Kombat fans know exactly what to expect when they make their purchase. Most importantly, the developers always delivered on that. 
So you know how Vendetta and Fight for New York were fast, hard-hitting, arcade-style fighting games with wacky original characters and crazy gravity-defying moves? Well, EA Chicago innovated by getting rid of all that. It emphasized backgrounds with bass, stylized, almost abstract environments that would change and move to the beat of the song and the fight. To make room for this, the fighting mechanics were pared back considerably, ditching Aki's engine and slowing it down. Way down. It also centered around realistic punches, attacks, dodges, and parries. You know, kind of like boxing. The biggest change of all, however, was at the center of the fighting system Aki had built upon the blazon moves. You know, the over-the-top bone-crunching... Aw, oh, fuck it, these things. So yes! They got rid of those. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, why exactly did this happen? Well, Mr. Mendheim has an answer. Whose idea was it to axe blazing moves? It wasn't so much that we looked at the old title and saw what we could get rid of. Everything was more about creating this buildings with base, and we had a limited timeline to get the product out. Hindsight, maybe we should have dropped buildings with base to put in all those cool finishing moves. It probably would have been the better call, but we put all our chips behind that innovation. Sometimes these bets work really well, like in Fight Night, and sometimes they don't. For Def Jam Icon, I'm proud of the team and what was accomplished, but we didn't deliver the core fighting mechanics, and it disappointed a lot of the original fans. Blaze and moves weren't the only thing that was scaled back considerably for Icon, as there certainly was one change that you couldn't really mask behind the idea of innovation. The roster. Vendetta clocked in with 40 fighters, with a mix of original characters, notable rappers, and a few members of the fairer sex. Fight for New York ballooned up to 67 characters, again, a mix of OCs, Def Jam artists, and even a few random celebrities. Def Jam Icon? 27 characters, 40 less than the last game. What's more is that certain talent like Snoop Dogg, Ice-T, Follow His Twitter, and Busta Rhymes were all cut. The same goes to those celebrities like Danny Trejo and, of course, Carmen Electra. Speaking of which, there's also no playable female characters at all. The concept of girlfriends was in all three games, but it's only Icon that stopped them from being playable. Lots of, i.e. all of the fan favorite originals are also gone, so that's like D-Mob, Manny, Pockets, and the rest. All of the warriors. Instead, make way for Big Herc and Fast Hal, two of the like uh, less than 10 that were created specifically for this game. What did good old Kudo have to say about this? How was the reaction when you approached these stars and asked if they wanted to be in the game? Did you have to turn anyone down? The reaction from the hip hop community has been tremendous. People are so happy that a game that accurately represents the hip hop lifestyle is finally being made. Since the music in our game affects the gameplay, we needed artists from many different areas of the country with different types of beats in their songs. So we cannot put everybody in the game that even we wanted to, but we are always excited to work with other artists on future Dev Champ games. Now, I get if he's presented with that question. I, I don't know what else he was supposed to say. Well, yeah, despite having 40 less characters than the previous game, yeah, everyone in the hip-hop community is banging down our door right now. Now, aside from changing everything about the fighting system and having a diminished roster, one other aspect that was considered a massive mistake was the complete lack of a UI, making players take note of bruises and blood to ascertain their boxers, I mean their fighters, health. Why Chicago thought this would translate to a more traditional fighting game is just, it's, it's, it's whack. The camera is usually pulled so far back that you don't always get a good view of your fighter, so it's incredibly hard to tell how well you're doing unless you've been, like, counting hits. Imagine playing an Arxis game, right? But then take away all the UI. What the fuck? What is, what's going on? I don't know what's going on here. Fight Night is the only reason EA Chicago got this job, and in the short time they had to put this together, they were utilizing too many of the same design aspects, even if they didn't translate well. 
Now, while it's admirable they attempted something different with the backgrounds and the fighting system, it didn't make up for the lack of depth with said fighting system, and especially, and most egregiously, cutting four player functionality, something that the first two games had. Now, despite all these very obvious downgrades, Kudo was still towing the company line, because I guess he had to, but he also had a habit of throwing digs at other games and even entire genres when he was promoting Def Jam. This isn't a game where you end up on the sofa just using some kind of preset waggle commands. Oh, right, he always did that. Why will Def Jam Icon become EA's premier fighting title as it completely switched to the next generation of gaming? Specifically, what are the major gameplay tweaks in this sequel? Instead of just doing some gameplay tweaks, we have created a product that would truly revolutionize how fighting games are played on the next-gen consoles. The fighting genre has been stagnant gameplay-wise for the last 10 years. No matter how much the technology evolved, the basic butt-mashing, constant, mindless attack gameplay in a lifeless environment has not changed at all. There have been no innovations. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Phew, we need a, we need a palate cleanser after that, so let's go back to Michael Mendheim about what innovation truly cost them. We didn't give fans what they wanted, we didn't do that on Def Jam Icon. The other problem was that while buildings with base and the art direction were fantastic, they didn't lend themselves to the core gameplay mechanics. What happened is that the fighting became sluggish. When you had these super realistic characters and animations, which again worked great for Fight Night as a boxing sim, it doesn't work for a fighting game because it isn't fast enough. One of the biggest knocks on the product were the sluggish fighting controls, and the fans were correct. That was the biggest problem with the game, unfortunately. If I could do it all over again, the fighting mechanics would be number one and the graphics number two. I was a producer on it, and I take full responsibility. I apologize to the fans for it, but I learned a wealth of things from that game. Now let's not get this twisted. Innovation does drive the industry, but it has to be for the better. It has to improve on a formula to be successful. Just making a few smart changes, like going from Street Fighter 1's control system to Street Fighter 2's, provided smoother controls and more deliberate depth, rather than slamming big red buttons. Yeah, Street Fighter 2 didn't have bumping and grinding backgrounds, did it? It was a similar game to its predecessor, it just played so much better. When Icon released, the reviews reflected this divide and were very mixed as you can imagine. Regardless of the critical reception though, it seemed to have performed well enough commercially for a sequel to be greenlit. The simply named Def Jam Icon 2 was uncovered a few years ago, with an early unfinished build being leaked onto the information superhighway. Icon 2 was still using the same core fighting system, but had some smart new additions that fans were clamoring for. More stylish combos, throws, and even being able to launch your opponent into the air, allowing for follow-up attacks. But you, but you know what happened next? Do, do, do you know? Even if the name of your studio literally has EA in the title, it doesn't mean you are safe from EA. Like at all. In mid-2007, former EA Games president Frank the Dreaded Behemoth Gibo stated, At EA, we're willing to take risks, make long-term investments, and to support teams and individuals between launches. Literally a lie. <laughs> but, but each team is responsible for staying on a reasonable path to profitability. Sticking to that strategy is what gives the financial resources and flexibility to take risks on new projects. Unfortunately, EA Chicago hasn't been able to meet that standard. The location has grown dramatically in the past three years, while revenue from the games developed there has not. The number of employees has grown from 49 in 2004 to 146 people currently in the new facility in downtown Chicago. As it stands, EA Chicago has no expectation of hitting our profitability targets until fiscal year 2011 or later. The same time as they were closing down EA Chicago and another branch in England, EA was also quite busy purchasing both Bioware and <sighs> Pandemic, leading some to believe that to soften the blow of that massive $800 million purchase that EA needed to make uh, cutbacks elsewhere. Not only did this kill Def Jam Icon 2, it was a death blow to yet another fighting game EA Chicago had been working on, a Marvel fighting game which was more or less a sequel to Rise of the Imperfects, which was named... 
Marvel fighting game. <sighs> I finally get to talk about this thing. It actually looked awesome, featuring tons of environmental destruction, a solid if not unspectacular roster of heroes and villains. The game was very early when it was first shown, and it went dark for almost a year once EA Chicago had closed down. Now, since Marvel was a fairly big license, EA tried to salvage it during this time, perhaps moving it to another team, before finally announcing its full cancellation in 2008. While the game was never shown after this initial footage, it never releasing might have been a blessing in disguise, because only three years after EA lost the license... Capcom presents Marvel Comics. Sorry for getting off track here, I, I just think that Marvel game is fascinating. So, where are they now? Well, kudos Sonoda. You ever wonder what the bottom of an Avatar shoe looks like? Well, bam! There it is. So yeah, he hasn't been a public figure in video games since that, but apparently he still works somewhere within Microsoft. Michael Mendheim started his own company, Digital Dreams Entertainment, and launched a successful Kickstarter to bring back Mutant League Football, in the guise of Mutant Football League, since he worked on the original games back in the 90s. The case of Def Jam Icon isn't so much of EA interference, but rather the sky-high ambitions and desire to innovate by a clearly talented team that simply weren't a good match for the source material. They definitely wanted to make something that would stand out, but like Menheim stated, they strayed too far from what the fans expected, which is unfortunate as Icon 2 seemed to be making strides to rectify that. As for Def Jam itself, well if you ever feel like getting frustrated, check out these tweets from the official Def Jam Recordings Twitter, where they heavily hinted they are considering reviving the series in some fashion. This sparked interest from lots of people, but there's been absolutely no updates since then. I can only imagine with the various rapper likenesses, the music, and the game be originally published by Ye, it would be a licensing nightmare to bring back. But like, damn it Def Jam, you could bring it back! That was your moment to own it, but you let it go! Oh, you only had one shot! Do not miss your chance to blow! This opportunity comes once in a lifetime! Oh, <sighs> Please tweet Def Jam Records at Def Jam to politely ask about the possibility of bringing back the first two games in some capacity, and we'll see what happens. In the meantime, if you know of any other fighting games that might be worthy of the What Happened treatment, I've already done Marvel Infinite, MK vs. DC, let me know in the comments below or flop your way to the Flophouse VIP Patreon to officially vote on our next topic. See you next time, and thanks for watching.